Hey, everybody. Welcome back. God bless you. Boy, what a week it's been, huh? A lot of stuff going on. Woo! Anyway, nothing we can't handle. That's how we roll around here. Anyway, I wanted to uh, welcome you back to our second service where we're actually not together, but we're live streaming. And then the goal is by next Sunday, we should be able to be back together uh, November the 1st. That's what my hope is. And so we're going to believe God for that. Okay. That being said, let's get into the word today. The text is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to pick it up from where we left off last week at verse 14 and 15. So let's pray first. So Father, we ask the blessing of God to be upon the word as it goes forth. We pray so that you would just minister to your people as we crack into the word. We, we want to be ministered by the word. We want to be um, empowered and encouraged, help us to rightly divide the word. And uh, we pray to God we'd be able to apply it to our lives in a relevant way. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Some people are saying, Pastor Rob, when you're praying, you're, you're looking at the camera. Your eyes aren't closed. It's freaking me out. But this is what I tell people. Listen, the Bible says to pray and watch. That's what I'm doing. Okay? So pray and watch. It works when I'm driving and it works when I'm praying for my food at a restaurant because I'm afraid someone's going to steal my food when I'm praying for it. Praise God. All right, let's pick it up. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14 and 15. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, and the one is a capital O, so that's referring to the Christ, then all died. Verse 15, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So the one died, for all. That's Jesus. He died for everyone. It was because of his love for us that he chose to die for us so that we could be saved through him. Hallelujah. It's a great word. Even though Christ died for all, not all will choose to receive him. That's probably the most unfortunate thing, reality. Everyone will die someday. This is part of the curse. But there is a remnant of believers who have received Jesus and have chosen to live for the Lord and not for themselves. I hope I'm talking about you. I know I'm talking about me. These same will one day rise again with Christ because they are hidden in Christ. And so we are given this promise that Christ died for all, but not all has received Christ. But those who have received him, he's given them the power, the ability to be called children of God. Praise the Lord. Verse 16, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. You see, we are to see individuals as either a brother or a sister in the Lord or a potential brother or sister in the Lord. I realize there are incorrigibles out there who will never, ever come to Jesus. And I feel bad for them, especially because they're just they're blinded. But we should not hold them in disdain. We must, we, we must not look at people at face value or flesh value. But as a fellow traveler to the grave and a potential fellow resident of God's kingdom, when my sons were younger and we'd be checking out at the supermarket, there'd always be these magazines at their level and always a pretty gal in the magazine. And sometimes they're scantily clad. And I used to teach them and said, son, you see that? that that beautiful girl there, that beautiful woman? You see, what's happening here is the our culture wants you to lust after her. So they want they want her to be an object of your lust. But the truth is she's a sub subject of God's creation. And so we can't look at people at flesh value, face value. Because you have a beautiful woman here, you have an ugly person over here, and then you're judging. So we try to teach them, hey, we love everybody and we want to we'll see the potential in everybody. Paul's saying, this is the picture. Some people possess more flesh appeal than others. And that's probably true. But Christ died for everyone. Those that are appealing and those that are not appealing. And a saved person is promised the same eternal reward in heaven as you are. If you're a believer, that is. We must not judge others by their outside appearance, their outside appeal, their life status, uh, or possessions. We must see them as God sees them, as beautiful, beautiful children. That's the mission. That's the mandate that we want to uh, recognize. Um, verse 17, this is a powerful passage. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man is in Christ, if any one is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If we are in Christ, and we are, 
then we are a new creation in Christ. All of the old stuff, the bad stuff, the dark stuff from our past is gone, baby. It's gone. And because we are in Christ, he has made all things new. Hakuna Matata. Hoorah. That's a great, that's a great uh, verse. I think we all get it. And I think we need to encourage others to recognize that we are new in Christ. All right, let's pick it up at verse 18. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. The word imputing is reckoning, like, hey, you did this, and you did that, and you did this, um, and has committed us to the word of reconciliation. So this passage is code for, because we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus, from a great debt of sin, we must compel others to be saved and reconciled or made right to God through Christ, made right in his sight. That's reconciled, made right. Paul is saying that God has reconciled or made right us to himself through Jesus. And as a result, we too should minister to others in the same reconciliation. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He didn't hold their trespasses against them, but he made a way of reconciliation for them to himself in spite of their sin. You know, the Bible says, if God were to count iniquity, who, O oh Lord, could stand? And the answer is nobody. And so the idea is that we shouldn't count iniquity either. So we should never have any unforgiveness or bitterness towards other people. Just very important. Sometimes people say that they're too much of a sinner to be saved. Oh, you don't know what I've done. I've done terrible things. They have done so many bad things, um, too many bad things that they can't be saved. And I'm going to tell you something. That's a lie from the pit because Jesus Christ himself saves. Jesus saves. Years ago, when I was a police officer, um, I'd go to various um, officer training uh, courses in various places. Usually, uh, police departments would host training for a specific area. So a bunch of cops would sign up, and they would go down there, and they'd get trained for a particular area that they needed to be trained in. And I remember going into the room, and the instructor was an ex-cop. He was actually a pretty hard dude. He was an older guy, but he was he was like old school. This guy had been through a lot of terrible things, drug and drug uh, agency, deep undercover. He was pretty, pretty messed up. He was dark. I could tell in his spirit. And so he said, tell us about you. Who are you? And he says, well, I'm a, a police officer with Guardian of PD. I'm also the department chaplain. He goes, chaplain, huh? Hey, listen, don't try and get me saved. I've already made an appointment with the devil and I don't want anyone messing it up. He said that in front of the whole class. Some of the officers are going, man, that's hardcore. And I remember thinking to myself, this guy, he's lost lost he's lost and some of the stories that he would tell us highly inappropriate things that he did and people he killed and just all part of the training motif and i remember thinking to myself lord if there's any way this guy could be saved some people are just incorrigible so they'll never they'll never come to faith they've already made their decision it's really sad so i just want to remind everybody that nobody is beyond the saving grace of jesus christ jesus saves period you know jesus says it this way in mark chapter 2 in verse 17b, he says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. For the truth be told, we're all sinners in need of repentance and also in need of reconciliation. You know, Paul continues, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. He says, now then, we are ambassadors of Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So an ambassador, if you don't already know this, is a representative of a king or a kingdom. And they act in the interest and agenda of the king that they are representing or the nation they are representing. And they must give an account of their actions to the king when they return to the country. So our ambassadorship to Christ was afforded us when we received Jesus as our Lord and Savior. His word is in us, and he has called us to share it with the world. We are, in his, we are his ambassadors. You know, before any king goes to war with the nation, he first removes his ambassadors from that nation that he's going to war with. So it is with us. God is about to go to war with this world. Before God begins his judgment on this world, he will first remove his ambassadors from this world. Now, what we're seeing right now is all the pre-show. But the judgment has not begun. The tribulation has not begun. This being the case, we must be about the master's business, occupying and doing business 
until he comes. Our commission of reconciliation is part of our faith mandate and is a reasonable expectation that God has placed upon us. So if God's called you to share your faith, that's reasonable that he would do that. Because we are Christ's ambassadors, we are saved. Hallelujah. Because we are saved, we want others to be saved. Glory to God. God is pleading with this world through us to be saved and reconciled to God through Jesus. Because God knows what happens to a person who dies without him. Folks, let's just call it the way it is. Hell is hot, it's real, and it's forever. And there's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. And only Jesus can help us to do it. The prophet Ezekiel said it this way. If you have your Bibles, Ezekiel chapter 33, let's pick it up at verse 10. He says this. Therefore you, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, thus you say, in our transgressions and in our sins, um, if our transgressions and our sins lie upon us, and we pine away in them, the word pine means waste. So if we waste away in them, how can we uh, then live? That's the question. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Remember, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn from his way and live. Turn, turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? Anytime you see a word repeated three times, it's a very big deal in Scripture. And so what he's basically saying is, is that God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And the reason why? He knows where they're going. Excuse me. <clears throat> now, while the context of this passage is Old Testament, the principle applies to the New Testament as well. We need to be reconciled to God through Jesus. Do this, we must repent of our wickedness and turn to the Lord for his salvation. That's pretty good. We can all agree to that. Let's read on. Verse 12. Therefore you, O son of man, say to the children of your people, the righteousness of the righteous man shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall because of it in the day that he turns from his wickedness. Nor shall the righteous be able to live because of his righteousness in the day that he sins. Let's break this down. Ezekiel exposes the lie of eternal security in the Old Testament. One verse, he says this, People who think that they are saved because of a one-time experience with God at an altar or as a baby in a church infant christening ceremony or at a first communion or a first baptism or whatever and such but who live their lives in sin and degradation are lost. And many of them don't even know it. So, I mean, I'd love to believe in eternal security. I'd love to believe it. And I believe in eternal security in the sense that I'm eternally saved because I love Jesus. But I also know that I have the ability to walk away from Christ. And that's my free will. I'll never do that because I love Jesus with my whole heart. But there are people out there who have an experience with God and they walk away. Now, the argument is, well, they weren't really saved. I beg to differ. I've seen people who have been on fire for the Lord. They love Jesus and they've walked away. They've walked away. Very, very sad. You know, it's bad, Theo, to believe that you're saved without living a life of obedience to the Lord. It really comes down to that. Sometimes when I'm witnessing to people, they'll say, well, I'm a Catholic. I said, really? I says, why are you a Catholic? Because I was baptized Catholic. I had a first communion. I went to Catholic school. I go to Catholic church twice a year, once at Christmas, once at Easter. Hmm. Are you a good Catholic or a bad Catholic? What do you mean? Well, I'm just saying, if you're a good Catholic, then you're going to do what the Bible says, right? And if you're a bad Catholic, you're not going to do what the Bible says, right? When's the last time you went to confession? Oh, it's been years. So you got to go to confession to confess your sins in the Catholic Church. But the Bible says there's one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Jesus. I'm not bashing Catholics. I just want people to understand this idea of eternal security is a bunch of hooey. You got to know it for what it is. People who have fallen away from grace and returned to a lifestyle of sin and degradation are equally lost, even if they do good things. The good that we do in this life can't save us from hell any more than the bad that we do keeps us from heaven. Let me say that again. The good that we do in this life can't save us from hell any more than the bad that we do keeps us from heaven. Listen up, folks. I want you to get this. People go to hell every single day when they die. Not because they were bad, but because they didn't receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. 
people who are bad or unsaved and repent of their wickedness and come to faith in Christ will go to heaven when they die, not because of their goodness, but because of their confession of faith in Jesus. Going to heaven or going to hell is contingent on our faith in God through Jesus Christ and our walk with the Lord in this life or lack thereof. It's not about good or bad. However, good or bad shows up as a reflection of our love for the Lord or our disdain of him. Our eternal heavenly reward can only be found in Jesus. And Jesus is the only one that can save us. We've got to get this. Luke reminds us this way. He says in, in Acts 4 and 12b, he says, There is no other name under heaven given among men which we must be saved. And of course, that name is Jesus. Paul concludes his thought in verse 21 of 2 Corinthians 5. He says this, For he made him, so for God made Jesus, who knew no sin, which means he was perfect, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. So God made Jesus, who knew no sin, that as Christ, who was perfect, became sin. That is, the sin of the world was placed upon Jesus when he was on that cross. He became the personification, the epitome of sin, and he died a sacrificial, sacrificial death with the sin of the world. Let me explain this in your Bibles. Matthew 27. I want you to get this. Verses 45. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, this is Jesus on the cross. Now the sixth hour to the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. So about three hours. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, God had forsaken Jesus because he had become sin on that cross. As he hung on the cross between heaven and earth, the sin of the world was imputed into his bosom to forever be nailed. Jesus died once for all for the sin of this world. There remains no other sacrifice for sin. When we receive Jesus as Lord and as atoning sacrifice for our sin, we are saved. It's as simple as that. Continue on in Matthew 27, verse 47. He said this, Some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran. One of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink. I don't have a lot of time to get into this, but the teaching goes that this sour wine was a, um, it was like a, a numbing agent, and he was trying to make it so Christ would be numb to the pain. He was giving him like a like medicine that would cause it to be numb. That's the theory. And Christ wouldn't take it, which means Christ wanted to bear the full brunt of pain on that cross. That was his mental state and mental anguish. That's an unconscionable thought. Very powerful. I don't have time to unpack that for you, but verse 49, the rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and save him. Come to save him. Verse 50, and Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. So while there is a lot we can say about the passage, the major point is that Jesus gave his life. He yielded up his spirit and died and the sin of the world with him. Your sin, my sin, the world's sin was absolved at the cross of Christ. Some people teach that because of this, nobody dies and goes to hell because Jesus paid the price for all sin. This is called the inclusion doctrine, and it's another doctrine of a demon. This doctrine says that everyone is saved and included in God's heavenly kingdom. They say that nobody goes to hell because of what Jesus did on the cross. This is an emergent lie from the pit. Christ gave his life. We have to receive it. The truth is, is what Jesus did on the cross only works if, if, everybody say if, if we choose to believe in the Christ, that he is God and that he, that his sacrifice on the cross was for our sin. If, if, there it is again, we place our faith in him. Salvation only works for us if. We receive Jesus as our Lord. That's a pretty big if. The Apostle Paul said a big if too. Romans 10, 9 and 10, he says this. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. So we must confess our sin to Jesus to be saved. We must believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. Both are necessary. Then we say, well, Pastor Rob, man, I, don't, I don't remember all the sins that I did. It's okay. Just say, Lord, all the sins. I confess everything. I come clean. 
The, the ones I remember, the ones I don't remember. I just want to be clean and right in your sight. God honors that prayer. It's not enough that Jesus died for our sins. We must receive the Christ, repent of our sin, turn from our old life, and live for the Lord. A heart change is necessary. We talked about that uh, last week or two weeks ago. With changed hearts make changed lives. Continue with uh, Matthew 27. This is getting better here. Verse 51. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. Verse 52. Now this, verse 51 and verse 52 are separated by three days. Just to let you know, we'll explain that. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, he resurrected three days later, they went into the whole city and appeared to many. So we had evidence. We had evidence. The evidence that God accepted Christ's sacrifice was the veil being torn in the temple at the moment, at the moment that Jesus died. And then the next verse, three days later, the resurrection of the saints from Abraham's bosom with Christ at his resurrection. In other words, some of the bodies, some of the people came back into their bodies. Most of the people went to heaven with Jesus, but some of them came back. The Bible says many of the Old Testament saints who had recently died came back to life into their bodies after Christ rose from the grave. So if there was ever a testimony from the grave of Christ's resurrection power, it's going to be this one. Jesus died on the cross for our sin. If we believe and receive him as our Lord and Savior and live for him according to his word, we're going to be saved. Praise the Lord. What Jesus did on that cross was remarkable. He provided a way for mankind, if they choose to receive it, to be freed from the consequence of our sin and to be welcomed into his heavenly kingdom. You know, Paul said it this way. This is in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 4 through 10. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. He's saying, by grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceedingly the exceeding riches of his grace in, in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So Jesus did the work of redemption on the cross at Calvary, and he has provided us a way into his heavenly kingdom through our belief in him and confession. Uh, of our sin. Um, I really want to break this down. God is rich in mercy. Remember, mercy is getting something that you don't deserve because of his great love, which he has for us. you got to believe God loved you. He loved you. He has got an everlasting love for you. And even when we're dead in our trespasses, he has made us alive together in Christ. In other words, why we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He says, it's by grace you have been saved. It's not... Grace, what is that? It's getting something that you don't deserve. Okay? So mercy is not getting something you do deserve. Grace is getting something you don't deserve. He raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Then the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. This passage right here, I've got a helicopter flying over. I have to wait for the helicopter to pass. Because I can't talk over a helicopter. So what he's basically saying is this is like a futuristic passage. He's saying this is where we're going to be. This is what we're going to do. And God's showing his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And then he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. In other words, we didn't deserve it. It's a gift of God. Listen, folks, we all get gifts, but the only way they work is if we receive them. Not of works. We can't work it. We can't earn our way into heaven. It doesn't work that way. Lest anyone should boast. Oh, I did this or I did that. God for sure will save me. It doesn't work that way. And then he goes on to say this in, in Ephesians 5, 10. He says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. In other words, God's got good things for us to do. He's got good works for us to do. Praise the Lord, right? As a matter of fact, God has prepared those good works beforehand that we should do them. We should walk in them, right? But that's not what saves us. Our good works are simply uh, an expression of our love for the Lord. We've been saved already. If anything, the good works that we do uh, give us uh, rewards in the kingdom. 
or being obedient to the Lord. So it's something we really need to understand that. Listen, if we only hear about what Jesus did for us, but we don't believe and receive him as Lord, then we're not saved. The only way we can become the righteousness of God in Christ is if, I-F, if, if we repent of our sin, receiving Jesus into our heart, asking Christ to forgive us, and then we need to live for Jesus by obeying his word and growing in our faith. So it's not just we have one-time experience with God and then we just go on with life. No, he wants us to grow and mature. He wants us to do our devos. He wants us to to, to worship him and, and, and be around other believers and, and get rid of things in our life that are not, not appropriate. He wants us to, to really cleanse ourselves from the latter. You know, this whole plan of salvation is not a works righteousness plan. It's a faith in God through Jesus plan that has been afforded to us by God's grace. In other words, if we want to get to heaven, if we want to enjoy our heavenly reward, the only way that's ever going to happen is if we accept the Christ. Jesus is the only way. He's the only way. There's no other way. I don't want to encourage you if you're watching this today. And I realize a lot of our people, obviously you're saved, but there are people watching this on YouTube or perhaps um, this is a, at a later time and you're watching this for the first time and you may not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You can be saved. Even if we're in the middle of the tribulation, somehow you're seeing this download. You can be saved. You can invite the Christ to be the Lord of your life. He will cleanse you. He will restore you. He will forgive you. And he will establish you a place in his kingdom. This is what the Lord promises for us. And I want to encourage you to believe that by faith. Believe it by faith. The master has made a way for you to be saved. You know, all these years that Pastor Debbie and I have been with you here in Gardena, almost 22 years now, I, I first set, set foot in the church in November of 98. That was a long time ago. And um, and I, I I just believe that all this time we've been preaching the gospel, we've been doing ministry, we've been working hard, serving the Lord, all the things that we've done, you know, it's been wonderful. And three years before that in Brewerton, preaching the gospel, preaching. And five years before that, when we were staff pastors at the various places, preaching the gospel and, and leading people to Jesus and sharing our faith with others and fellowshipping and so forth. All of that was a process that God afforded us. It's been a great ride. And uh, I want to encourage you Faithful to the things of the Lord. Faithful to what he's called you to. His return is very soon. We believe it. We really do. But until he gets here, we want to make sure that we are doing everything in our power to be good stewards of our faith and good stewards of the things that God has called us to. So I want to challenge you with that. This is the word of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So let me pray for you. I want to pray the blessing of God upon your life. Would you stretch your hand for the screen here? Now, Father, I pray the blessing of God upon these wonderful people. I pray so in Jesus' mighty name. And I thank you, Lord God, that you will be glorified in what you say and do in this situation. And I pray right now, by faith, I speak it forth in Jesus' mighty name. And I believe by faith, Lord God, that you're going to be glorified in their life. I love them so much. I want them to be okay. I pray to God that you would watch over and protect them, keep them safe. I pray they'd be COVID-free, that you would provide for them, keep them secure. I pray they would keep their eye on the prize, knowing it's not we're not far off. And I pray by faith, Lord God, that you continue to bless them and secure them and, and empower them by your Holy Spirit to be good stewards of their faith and to, to share their faith with others. Thank you for it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit of all God's people said. Praise the Lord. Hey, listen, stand by. Um, we have a special message I want to bring to you. Um, I'm going to reset up here, and uh, we have a special message we want to bring to you, but I'm going to do it under a separate cover, but it's going to trail this message. If you just stand by for a few moments. God bless you. Thank you. Hello. Thanks for uh, sticking around for this video. God bless you. Listen, uh, Debbie and I wanted to let you know that we feel like our time here at Gardena Valley is coming to a close. And I realize this might seem like a shock uh, to a lot of people just coming out and saying it, but I just feel like it's the best way to communicate, you know, what God's put on our heart. Um, we've had some good years with you, 22 years to be exact. You know, we raised our kids with you. We've had lots and lots of memories. Great ministry, good times. But I'm feeling in my own heart that maybe my time as a lead pastor is coming to a close, coming to an end. You know, I've been doing it for 25 years now, 20, 22 years here and three years in Brewerton. 
And as we're getting older, we're feeling that maybe it's our time to, to move on. And we're setting our sights towards Lee Summit, Missouri to be with our kids and our grandkids. We don't know what waits for us there. <clears throat> we're just going by faith. But we believe that this is something that God has placed on our hearts. We've been feeling a stirring for quite some time. And my line is, if I know something, you'll know something. But, but the truth is, is that we've been feeling a stirring for a while. And while we're not sure what it is that God has for us in Lee Summit, Missouri, we do know that's where we're supposed to be. You know, <clears throat> I wanted to get through this year. I wanted to get through the feasts, the fall feasts in particular. And um, I just, I wanted to be able to, you know, complete this year, this COVID year. It's been a crazy year for all of us, um, to say the least, that I just, uh, feel that as I've been being more introspective and seeking the Lord, I've just feeling like this is kind of a, a feeling in a direction he's taking us. The staff and the council are very much aware of the decision, and I'm confident that um, God will be in the transition process, and he will transition our church perfectly, and he's going to do it in his way, and he's going to do it in his time, and um I just feel like you need to know this. We won't be transitioning out until probably early to mid-December, but we will continue to lead effectively as we have been until then. Now is a time for leadership transition for our church. It's going to be a season where God is going to show himself strong. He's going to show himself strong in, in our lives. And I realize that for a lot of you, you're listening to us say this right now, you're thinking, oh my goodness, that's a shock. You know, we had no idea. But the truth is, is that, um, you know, I, I feel like this is what we're supposed to be doing. I feel like, you know, we've done our, our call here. And although there's, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, no one's going to question that. It's just that for Debbie and I, we feel like this time has, has come to a close. It's coming to a close. And um, this, this church is in great shape. I mean, we have good leadership in place. There's a good board in place. We have good staff in place. Ministries are happening. Things are happening. The finances are, are decent. People have been faithful. Thank you for your faithfulness, you know. And we pray that whatever God has for the next chapter of Gardena Valley Assembly, um, we know that it's going to be a good chapter. So although we don't know what the future holds with all the speculation of what may or may not happen, we do know that God is in complete total control. I wanted to read a passage to you that I think that God put on my heart as I was putting this together and I felt it was an appropriate passage. It comes out of Jeremiah chapter 29. When we did our study in Jeremiah, we talked about this and I talked about how um, we we see a lot of, of, of uh, this this uh, this word, we see a lot of this when you when we have kids that do graduations and things like this, but I really felt it was appropriate. And it starts up with verse 11, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And verse 12 says this, and then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with your whole heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord. And so the message for us is each of us needs to really keep our eye on the Lord, keep our focus on the Lord as we transition through this time. Debbie and I, we're going out not knowing where we're going. We're not knowing what's waiting for us out there. And you, as you trust the Lord, as the transition of leadership is manifest, believe me, the council is aware and they are uh, prepared to, to, to effectively lead. We've got a good plan in play and I think it's uh, good. So I encourage you, and I want to challenge you to um, consider this as we move forward. And we're going to continue to bring you the word. We're going to continue to serve you and, and, and throughout the rest of uh, this month and all of next month and a little bit into to December. And um, we have uncertain times in our head, but we're trusting the Lord and we want you to do the same. So we wanted you to be able to hear this from our home, from our heart to you. And we hope that, uh, we hope that at the end of the day, this is... This is, uh, will be acceptable as far as the way we presented this. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for sticking around, and uh, God bless you. Have a great day.